chapter 9. It was my hope to take the first 31 verses of this, this story of Paul's conversion. The more I prepared for this, the less I was able to feel I could take, and so I'm only going to take the first nine verses. What a story this is. And it'll be a job to get through the first nine verses tonight, believe me. But it's a wonderful story of the most amazing conversion that has ever happened, I think. Verses 1 to 9 of chapter 9. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Well, we'll look at that amazing incident in a moment. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus is the most famous conversion in all history. The greatest enemy of the Christian faith became the greatest friend. The greatest opponent became the greatest advocate. And this chapter retails this most amazing story. Now, not only is this the most famous conversion in history, it's the most important. Because it is through this man that we Gentiles got the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We owe half the New Testament to this man under God. And though we have the facts of our Lord's life, death and resurrection in Matthew, Mark and Luke and John, it is from Paul that we get the gospel. He was the first and indeed the only writer in the Bible to state the gospel in a straightforward way in his letter to the Romans. And that one letter has been more influential in Christian history and even in secular history than any other writing. It was the discovery of the meaning of the third chapter of that letter that changed St. Augustine's life. It was the discovery of the meaning of the fifth chapter of that letter that changed Martin Luther's life. It was the discovery of the meaning of the eighth chapter of that letter that changed John Wesley's life. And so I could go on. You will discover that it is to this man, Saul of Tarsus, that under God we in Europe owe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it all began on the road to Damascus. Now there are two things I want to say by way of warning before we read this story. The first is, this is not a typical conversion. I say that because many have felt that they must go through this kind of experience to become a Christian. I do not know of anyone else who has been converted in just this way. Nor does anyone else. This is quite unique. There are features of his conversion which have not occurred in anyone else's. And if we think that we must expect a lightning flash from heaven before we can become a Christian, then we've made the mistake of taking one man's experience as the pattern for everybody's. Now, I didn't have a very dramatic conversion, though I do remember the date I became a Christian. 
And there were many things that Paul experienced that I didn't. And there were one or two things that I experienced that I don't think he did on the road to Damascus. But the main thing is we both knew Christ. And that's the important thing. I don't mind whether you had a dramatic, sudden conversion or a gradual, quiet one. The important thing is, are you converted? Have you met Jesus Christ? So that's the first word of warning. Marvelous though it is to listen to such a story, we must not be depressed or discouraged if we didn't have a conversion just like this. The important thing is, did I or did I not meet Christ at some point in my life, whatever the circumstances? Indeed, Paul himself said he was the last to meet Jesus in this particular way. He said Jesus had appeared to Peter, to John, to the others, to the twelve, to five hundred at once, and last of all, he appeared to me. In other words, I had a unique meeting with Jesus. So this is not a typical conversion. Secondly, this is not a sudden conversion. I know it all seems to happen so quickly. There he is walking along a road and minutes later he's a Christian. It seems so sudden and yet it is not because one of the things that Jesus said to him when he met this man was it is hard for you to kick against the pricks which means that there had been a considerable process of preparation within his mind and heart long before this dramatic crisis. And if you have a dramatic crisis at your conversion, I would think that if you look back, you'll realize that God had been stepping into your life for a long time before, preparing you, speaking to you, bringing you to this crisis. So it is not a sudden conversion in the sense of a conversion out of the blue. I will tell you in a moment what led up to it. But let's look at this man for a moment, a man called Saul. A man who literally had everything but Christ. Materially, mentally, morally, he had everything but Christ. And therefore his life was a waste of time. And a man may have everything else, but if he doesn't have Jesus, his life is a waste of time. And when he meets Jesus, he will look back over his former life and say, what a waste, what rubbish. It's just so much to throw away now, all that I've tried to do. That's how you think when you meet Jesus. You can have everything but him. And when you meet him, you realize you had nothing. The Bible states quite simply that he that has the Son of God has life. He that has not the Son does not have life. That was the one thing this man didn't have. Well now what did he have? He was a man of culture, a man of education. He'd been brought up in a Greek city, the city of Tarsus, where education was second to none. There was a university in that city. There was much cultural activity. Music, art, drama was in that city. He had all that. He was a Roman citizen, which means that he was a man of some wealth and a man of some position. It means that he had certain privileges which very few other people had. A man who was very high in the social scale. So he had that as well as culture and education. But above all, he was a man with a, a really deep religion. It had been bred in him. He'd taken it in with his mother's milk. He was a man who'd come from a long ancestry of Jewish Jews. He could trace his line right back to the first Saul. He could go right back to the tribe of Benjamin. He'd got all his family tree. It had been bred into him. He'd known the Bible from his earliest days. He was religious to his fingertips. Here's a man who's got everything but Jesus. That's the man who met Jesus on the Damascus Road. Now I want to say something about his temperament because that comes into your conversion and it comes into your Christian life. And in terms of what we were discussing a few months ago on Thursday evenings, Paul was a typical choleric temperament. Now lest that word put you off, let me tell you what I mean. He was a man with ambition, a man with drive, a man with determination, 
a single-minded man, a man who would set himself a high goal and he would go all out for it. A man who would really go places, a man who would make himself a career that would take him to the top. That was Paul. It's a temperament that can take you a long way. And it was this temperament that marked this young man out as a man so full of promise that his teachers and his elders saw in him one of the future leaders of the nation of Israel. He went to university in Jerusalem as well as Tarsus. He studied under one of the greatest scholars of the day, a man called Gamaliel. And everybody marked this young man out for a great career. A man with everything at his feet. But he wasn't at anybody else's feet. And that's what was wrong. He was a man who would readily make slaves of others. But he was a man who would do no good until he became someone's slave. That's one of the dangers of this temperament. And the other danger of it is that while you are very determined to get to your goal, you will ride ruthlessly over anyone who stands between you and the goal. You will sweep them aside, trample on them if they stand in your way. Some of the world's greatest criminals and dictators have come from this temperament. And Paul might have been a dictator. He nearly was a religious dictator. Pharisee of the Pharisees and his religion could be summed up in one sentence he was determined to get to heaven under his own steam and he got very nearly there but very nearly is not enough well now why was he so violently anti-Christian if he was so determined to be a good Jew why did he run around and drag men and women out of their homes and fling them into prison there are two reasons that I think lay behind this fanatical cruelty. You almost see Hitler's attitude to the Jews in Saul's attitude to the Christians. And the other side of anti-Semitism, the Gentiles' reaction to the Jew, is the Jews' reaction to the Christian, which is just as strong and just as malicious and deadly. And Paul was as anti-Christian as many with his temperament have been anti-Jewish. Now why? Two reasons. First of all, he saw that Christianity could be a rival to his own religion. And a man like this cannot abide any rivalry. He must obliterate any rivals. He must stamp on any threat to what he stands for. And so we find him treating Christianity as a possible rival. And he realized quite simply what Jesus had said before, that Christianity and the Jewish religion don't mix. Not the kind of Jewish religion that Paul had, which was a do-it-yourself salvation. And he saw perfectly well that there are only two kinds of religion in the world. His was one kind, and the religion of Jesus was the other. And hence, Jesus and the Pharisees were at complete loggerheads. And these are the two kinds of religion, because there may well be some here tonight who are living in Paul's kind of religion. I meet them every day. Here is Paul's kind of religion. You must do your best in order to get to heaven. Whether you spend eternity with God or not depends on how well you do on earth. It depends on how well you live, how many kind deeds you do to others, how far you can manage to be worthy of God's standards and to merit his salvation. In other words, that way to heaven is the way of justice. In other words, I want to be good enough so that God must justly give me heaven. It's a religion that places the emphasis on justice. I want to deserve to get there so that he will have to take me in because I deserve it. I'm good enough. The other kind of religion which Jesus came to teach is a religion of mercy that gets a man to heaven the moment he says, God be merciful to me a sinner. I don't deserve it and I never will. 
And this is basically the difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world, including Judaism. Study the writings of the other religions of the world. Study Hinduism, study Buddhism, study Islam, study Shintoism, study Confucianism, and you will find this is so. Every other religion says, justice, deserve, do your best, be good enough. And Christianity says you never will get there, never, because you'll never be good enough. What you need is not justice, it is mercy. When you realize that you'll never get there under your own steam and you come to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, instead of having to batter at the gates of heaven, they're flung wide open. In other words, the only people who'll ever get to heaven are beggars who beg for mercy. And Paul realized that these two religions would never mix. Jesus said it's like new wine in an old bottle. It'll crack the bottle. This religion of the Pharisees, it just won't mix with mine. Mine is free grace and favor, the mercy of God. Yours is justice, justice, justice. And you'll never make it. And so Paul fought the Christians because he saw that there wasn't room in the world for Judaism and Christianity. And he'd sold himself to Judaism. He'd given his whole life to it. And he could not stand a rival. Now that's the first reason. And he was so fanatically anti-Christian, he became the first anti-Christian missionary. The first man to leave his home and his land and to go overseas, to go into other countries, to stop the Christian gospel. We live in a day in which there is an increase in anti-Christian missionaries who are prepared to travel to stop the Christian gospel. But Paul was the first, a missionary against Christ, a man prepared to go out and fight these Christians. There must be more explanation than I've given you for his fanatical cruelty, dragging men and women off to prison till he'd got a prison full, then hunting them into the next country. Mind you, it must have maddened him to realize that the more he persecuted them and the more they ran, the more the gospel spread. It seemed as if he couldn't keep up and he didn't know which direction to run after them and finally decided, Damascus, I'll make for that. We'll stop them there and then I'll come back and catch those who went to Samaria. And off he went to Damascus. Why? Here is the second reason. He not only saw Christianity as a possible rival, he had a horrible, horrible suspicion that Christianity was right. And when a man gets that, psychologically, he will fight harder than ever. I'm much more encouraged when a man fights Christianity. When a man is really against it, rather than just indifferent to it, it means he's beginning to think it might be right. As with the college lecturer who had in his notes, argument weak, shout here. And maybe that's why preachers shout a bit, I don't know. But he was psychologically just being true to type. That if you have a suspicion you're wrong, you will fight and fight and fight harder. You'll become even more vehement in your denials. And I think the reason why Paul was fighting the Christians was not just because Christianity was a rival, but because he had a suspicion that Christianity was right. And if the Christians were right, everything he'd done was wrong. Everything he'd hoped in was wrong. Everything he tried to do was, as he, he later said it himself, was dung, refuse, waste to be thrown out. And he didn't want to face that, nor does anybody else. His own lecturer, Gamaliel, his lecturer in the University of Jerusalem, had said to those students in their presence, Beware what you do about these Christians. You might just be fighting against God. And Paul said, never. This is not of God. This is heresy. Do you know yesterday afternoon I sat on the grass in Hyde Park and talked to a Jew from Toronto, Canada about the Lord Jesus. He was most educated and he could really speak logically, clearly, 
I, I don't think I've ever met a man who, who seemed to have such a breadth of knowledge and grasp of things. He could argue about all philosophers. He'd read Christian theologians. He'd read philosophers. He was busy reading Freud's interpretation of dreams when I came across him. And we talked and he believed in God. And he believed that there must be a God and that we must be rightly related to him. He believed all this. And so much that we believe he believed. But when I said that Jesus was the Son of God, he looked at me and he said, Heresy! That was his reaction. He would lose everything if he believed that. And Paul was like this young man that I met yesterday. Educated, cultured, everything but Jesus. He dare not admit that this could be right and true. Well now, what had caused Paul to begin to think that Christians might be right? Jesus was going to say to him as he travelled that road, Paul, you're like an animal whom a driver is driving in a particular direction with a pointed stick which they called the prick, which was to goad an animal to steer it. From behind, the plowman would use this to keep the animal straight. If it strayed this way, he would prick it, and it would get back in line. And Jesus was going to say to Paul, Paul, you're trying to get out of my way for you. You keep kicking, and you don't kick me. You kick the pricks. You're hurting yourself by doing all this. It's you you're hurting. Why was he kicking against the pricks? Let's just go back over his life. It may be that Paul had seen Jesus in the flesh. It is quite possible he was a student in Jerusalem at the time of our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection. And in one letter Paul says this, Some of us have known Jesus after the flesh, though we don't know him like this anymore. And it may be that he was referring to someone he once saw hanging on a cross when he was a young student. I don't know if that was one of the pricks against which he was kicking or not. It's speculation. He had certainly seen the early disciples. He'd got a prison full of them. And they were absolutely convinced that Jesus was alive and therefore prison seemed to have no terror for them. And with holy boldness they would get up in court and twist their judges' arguments into knots and charge their judges with murder. Never met people like this, ordinary people, illiterate people, fishermen, and their arguments were better than his and he'd been educated in logic, in how to talk, how to argue with law. That must have been one of the pricks, but I'll tell you the biggest one. It was the death of a young man called Stephen. He couldn't get over that. There had come a day when this young man had appeared before the Jewish Sanhedrin, of which Paul was now a part. And that young man had taken his judges through the Old Testament and had said, There you are from your own scriptures. I show you that you can't lock God up in your temple and in your holy land Every time he appeared to Abraham, to Moses, it was outside your holy land. He appeared to Abraham in Ur, he appeared to Moses in Sinai, and you think you've got God locked up in your temple. And they were so furious with Stephen, they stoned him. And Saul was given the jackets to hold while the man rolled up their sleeves and threw the boulders down on, the, on Stephen. And Saul stood there holding the jackets and looking down. And he'd never seen a man die like that before. Here was a man who died in hope. Here was a man who was just going to Jesus. Here was a man who was convinced that Jesus had risen from the dead, therefore he would be alive beyond the grave. Here was a man who looked up as he died and said, I can see Jesus. He's just waiting to receive me. Lord Jesus, here's my spirit, receive my spirit. And he'd never seen a man die like that. This was life. A man being stoned to death and he was alive and he had peace with God 
And he believed that Jesus was alive. And as Saul stood there holding the jackets that day, he said, it can't be true. It can't be. Jesus is dead. He, he was put on a cross. He was buried. He's not alive. The man's deluded. But a little doubt in his mind said he's not deluded. Jesus is alive. And this man has real life. He's found the way to heaven. And it's not the way of trying to do good. It's the way of believing in Jesus. That then was the biggest prick. I want you to imagine the journey that Paul made to Damascus that day. 150 miles. I've made part of it myself. It would take about seven days. Striding ahead the Pharisee. He wouldn't even mix with his attendants. Striding ahead down the road. This young man. On the way to murder men and women. To drag them to jail. And so determined is he to get there, to kill and to imprison, that he is traveling in the midday sun, a thing nobody does unless they're on urgent business. And in the midday sun, this man is striding ahead and his attendants are behind him. And he comes within sight of Damascus in what is now Syria. I think it is most significant that he met Jesus within sight of Damascus. Do you realize the significance of that? Of course it was before he got near any Christians, so it was before he could do them harm. But that's not the significance. The significance was that this Jew of Jews, Hebrew of the Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees, didn't meet Jesus till he stepped out of the Holy Land. Till he was off Jewish soil till he was on unclean territory, that he would have said is, is not God's land at all. And it was there that he met Jesus. It was the lesson that he had to learn, that you've got to get out of your own prejudice, out of your own religion, out of your own everything, if you're going to meet Jesus. And there you'll meet the Savior. Now let's look at his conversion. This man who had everything but Jesus. And therefore had nothing. It was not lightning and thunder as some of his attendants thought. It was like that. Suddenly at midday there was a light in the sky brighter than the midday sun. In those days there was no light as bright as that. There is one light now as bright as that that we know. I remember reading the terrible story of Hiroshima. And I remember reading the account of one man who was in Hiroshima when the atom bomb dropped and he said, a light came that was brighter than the midday sun. I remember remembering this. But this is in the days before atom bombs. And this was not a destructive light. A light came brighter than the midday sun. And it flashed from heaven and Paul fell on the ground. Then came the voice. It was in his own language, and it was someone who knew his own name. When you meet Jesus, you get the sense, he knows me. You might be in the middle of a congregation like this. You might be in the, in the middle of a crowd of thousands, and suddenly you feel Jesus speaking to me personally. It's the most amazing thing that Jesus knows every one of us by name. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul. What do you think is the most important word in the question that he asked? Why are you persecuting me? Well, the why challenges this young man to think through what he's doing and produce a justification for his persecution. But the really important word in this is the word me. And it's the word that Paul fastened on immediately. Me? Who's me? Who is this talking to me? But he didn't just say that. He said, Lord. And here is the dilemma in Paul's mind. Let me try and shape it for you. The dilemma was, this light is the light of the glory of God. There's only one light brighter than the sun. And that's the glory of God. It must be God. Lord God. And yet it can't be God because I've been following God all my life. I'm not against God. I'm against these Christians. I'm not against God. I believe in God. And so many people say to me, you know, I'm not against the church, I'm not against these things, I believe in God. Ah, but Jesus says, you're against me. You're against me. Who are you, Lord? 
You must be God and yet you can't be God because I'm not fighting God. Who are you, Lord? Who's this me? And then comes the most amazing statement. I am Jesus. Which do you think is the most important word there? I'll tell you. Two words. I am. You know what those words are, don't you? That's the name of God. It's the name by which Moses knew God. It's the name that Paul dare not pronounce. No Jew pronounced that name for fear of being struck dead. It was too holy a name, too reverent. God is the great I am. And the voice said, I am Jesus. And the name which Paul had known all his life as the name of God became the name of Jesus that moment. Jesus? Then he was alive. Then he was the son of God. Then he was wrong. Stephen was right. This Jesus was the son of God. Not just a great man. Not just even the greatest man. This Jesus was God, Jehovah. The son of God, the eternal God. The son of the eternal father. Jesus, I am Jesus. And he saw something else too. That your attitude to Christians is your attitude to Christ. That if you laugh at Christians, you're laughing at Christ. If you criticize Christians, you're criticizing Christ. If you attack Christians, you're attacking Christ. If you persecute Christians, you're persecuting Christ. If you put Christians in prison, you're putting Christ in prison. Your attitude to Christians is your attitude to Christ. For inasmuch as you do it to the least of these his brethren, you do it to him. Paul in that terrible moment realized that he was guilty of attacking the Son of God himself. It's a terrible thing to realize that the person you've really been hurting is Jesus. Do you know what the worst sin in the Bible is? The very worst sin in this book? It is the sin of not believing in Jesus. Again and again we're told this. That if you've heard about Jesus and you've heard that he is the son of God and your savior. That he died that you might be forgiven. That he died to make you good. That you might go at last to heaven saved by his precious blood. If you've heard that and not believed it for yourself. That's the worst thing you could have done. And there may come a day when you realize that you did this to Jesus. That God loved the world that he gave his only son the biggest present you ever got. And you threw it back in his face and said, I can manage. I'll get to heaven. I'm good enough. I can make my own way there. Thank you. I don't need help. It's the worst thing you can do. And Paul realized that he'd been fighting against God. Gamaliel had been right. His old lecturer back in Jerusalem had said, Saul, be careful. You might be fighting against God. And he had been. What did he expect to happen next? If you had been Paul, what would you have expected? To be incinerated on the spot by another flash of lightning? That would have been justice. To have been put in prison yourself, that would have been justice. To have been tortured, put to death, that would have been just. And I'm quite sure if that had happened to Paul, he would have said, it's only what I deserve. But the voice said, get up, get up. Go into the city and you'll be told what to do. Isn't that amazing? Not a single rebuke, not a single bit of punishment, nothing. Just go and wait and I'll tell you what to do next. Which brings me to the second thing I want to say about Jesus. Jesus challenged him, but the second thing he commanded him. The second biggest surprise of his life, the first was to meet Jesus and know that he was alive. The second biggest surprise of his life was that instead of wondering what Jesus was going to do to him, Jesus said, you will learn what you are going to do for me. This was the surprise. Jesus wasn't going to do anything to him for all this. Jesus was saying, now what you're going to do for me 
You've been against me all this while, but now you're going to be for me. You've been fighting against me, now you're going to fight for me. You've become a missionary against me, you're going to be a missionary for me. You go and I'm concerned with what you are going to do for me, not what I'm going to do to you. I'm not going to do anything to you except make you my slave. Two things come out of this, the mercy of Jesus and the majesty of Jesus. No conversion, I think, is complete unless it experiences both. The mercy of Jesus is that when you meet him and realize how you've treated him and refused him all these years, that you find he doesn't punish you for it, he doesn't rebuke you for it. He wants to start from that moment and make you a new life. That's the mercy of Jesus. But in the same moment you meet the majesty of Jesus and the majesty of Jesus is that you've met the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and that from now on he commands. In other words, when you come to Jesus, you're not doing him a favor, he's doing you a favor. You're not coming in a patronizing way and saying, well, Jesus, if you'd like to come into my life, poor old thing standing outside the door and knocking, come on in. You're not doing that at all. And that famous text about standing at the door and knocking is not a text for people who are not Christians. It was addressed to Christians. It's not a conversion text at all. This isn't the picture. It's not that Jesus is pleading to come in. Jesus confronts us. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He steps right into your life. And he says, now I'm going to tell you what to do. And so he commands him. Do you know, forever after, Paul always called himself two things. An apostle, because he'd been sent by the Lord Jesus, and a slave of Jesus Christ. He always called himself that. Paul, a bond slave of Jesus. And from his conversion onwards, he was a slave, and that's just what his temperament needed. He would achieve great things provided somebody else bossed him. And if he'd made his own career, he would have wrecked his own life and others. He needed someone to boss him if he was going to make the most of his gifts and his experience, his education and his culture and all the other things. Only if God was in control of his life would these things be useful. It was a total surrender that day. He got up. Now there was one other thing, and with this I close. He was blinded. Blinded. He got up, and he opened those eyes, and he couldn't see a thing. It was black, midnight. And the friends rushed up to him and helped him to his feet, and they said, Are you all right? Are you all right? What's happened? They heard him talking. They couldn't see anyone there. They thought he'd gone mad. And they looked into those blank eyes, and they realized he was sightless. And this great, tough man who'd been striding on ahead of them in the midday sun, eager to get hold of those Christians and drag them into prison. This man had to be led like a little child by the hand into Damascus. Can you see him stumbling over every pebble? A man whom God has broken. I don't think you ever get anywhere in the Christian life until God has taken your life and smashed it. Until he's broken you so that you come as a little child and put your hand out. Melt me, what is it? Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. How can you hope to be filled? How can you hope to be molded? How can you hope to be God's man until you've got to the point where you're broken? This poor little Jew now. You wouldn't have given tuppence for him walking along the road now. This man with a career set ahead of him, here he is stumbling in. Will you help me? Where's the door? And in he comes. And he sat there for three solid days. He didn't eat, he didn't drink, he couldn't see to feed himself. He didn't eat and he didn't drink, he didn't want to. He sat there for three days thinking, thinking. Why did God blind him? I think to help him to see. 
there was a flash of light from heaven so bright that it blinded these eyes, but it illuminated his whole being. And he was saying to himself through those three days, I'm quite sure, I've been so blind, but now I can see. I was blind to Jesus. I thought he was a criminal. Now I see he's the Son of God. I thought he deserved to die. Now I see it was the worst thing we ever did. I thought he was dead and gone, and now I see that he's alive. And I think God blinded him to help him to see. And he saw. This man was to become one of the greatest missionaries who's ever lived. I love his writings more than any other part of the Bible, I think. They have meant more to me than anything else that I have read. And there are many of you who would say the same thing, and it all began that Damascus day. My time is gone, but I'm not quite finished. I want to tell you about one other man. Because this happened 2,000 years ago, and you might feel it's a little remote. In my Bible, there are two names of human beings. One is mine, in case I lose it. And the other is the name of a man, Mr. F. Namour. N-A-M-M-O-U-R. There's one other person in the church here tonight who knows this man too. Mr. Namour was Colonel Nasser's first agent in Jordan. He would go once a month down to Egypt to receive his orders from Nasser to stir up trouble in old Jerusalem and in Jordan. He was the secretary of the National Union of Teachers in Jordan. He was a political agitator and he would lecture to students in such a way that they would go out into the streets and riot and kill people. He was the man behind most of the troubles in Jordan. And this man was a man with a great career. He was looking forward to being one of the top political dogs when Hussein fell. And this man had once given lectures against Christianity, and to do so he'd read a bit of the Bible, including the Sermon on the Mount. But that's all he knew of Christianity. He'd never been to church, he'd never met a missionary. And this man was there in Jerusalem stirring up trouble. Part of his ambition was to have a wife and a family, and he married a, a beautiful Jordanese girl. And then they had a little baby daughter, and his cup of joy was complete, and he thought he'd got everything. High in political circles in the Middle East, lovely wife, little girl. But she was born a blue baby, and she died. And he was so cut up about it that he had a heart attack and was rushed into Jerusalem hospital. And while he lay there in the bed in hospital, his wife came to see him. And there was one phrase going through his mind again and again. He couldn't get rid of it. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he thought, where have I seen that? Where have I read it? And he thought, you know, my little baby girl was my treasure and she's dead. And my heart has had this attack because it followed my baby girl. She's my treasure and my heart's dead now. And then as his wife sat by the bedside, he looked at the foot of the bed. There was nobody there. But he started talking to someone at the foot of the bed and his wife thought he was delirious. But he wasn't. He said to her afterwards, Do you know who's just spoken to me? And she said, No, who? And he said, Jesus. And he said to me, Three days, three days. He said, I don't know what it means. He said, It's either that I'll be better and out of hospital in three days or else I'll be dead in three days. Three days later, though, the doctor said he would be months in that hospital, he walked out of the hospital a fit man. And as soon as he got out, he began to preach about Jesus. And he soon had led a number of Arabs to the Lord, and he'd started a little church. And on the rooftop of his house, there was a room which he made into a meeting room. And here he met with 60 converted Arabs. And still he hadn't met a missionary, and still he hadn't been to church. The only thing he had was an Arab Bible. And one Easter Sunday morning when we were out there with a party, there had been a riot two days before and we were under curfew and nobody was allowed out. The streets were deserted. But we got permission to go out and on Sunday morning, the party that we had set out to look for a place to worship. 
and there was nobody to be seen, just an odd soldier with a machine gun at a street corner. And then we saw this man leaning over a rooftop and he was saying, come up, come up. And when we went up, we said, who are you and, and why did you say come up? He said, I have a little church here, but none of my people can come to it this morning. And it's Easter Sunday. And he said, I've prepared a sermon on the resurrection. I've got to preach it to somebody. And I knew that nobody could come because of the curfew. And I've been praying for two hours that God would give me a congregation to preach to. And he said, when I looked over the roof and saw you coming, I knew that God had answered my prayer. And we went up into that little room and Mr. Namor told us the story of his conversion. A man who preached against Christ. A man who'd stirred up trouble, a man of ambition, a man who was really going to the top. A modern man. Then he met Jesus and his life was changed. I don't know where he is today. He disappeared into Damascus, the very place that we've been speaking of. The Baathists got hold of him, his political enemies. And the church in Jerusalem is closed now. And all I've got now is his name in my Bible. I don't know whether he's alive or dead. Whichever he is, he's living because he knows Jesus. Why have I told you that story as well? Because you might say about the first story, it's, a, it's in the Bible, it's old stuff, it's 2,000 years ago. You might not have as dramatic a conversion as Saul. You might have, not have as dramatic a conversion as my friend Mr. Namor. But I'll tell you this, you can meet Jesus Christ today. In fact, the majority of the people here in this congregation are here because they met him. And if you didn't, may I finish where I began. You may have everything but Jesus. And if you have, you've got nothing. You may have nothing but Jesus. But if you have, you've got everything. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, it feels strange to be talking about you in your presence, but there may be someone here who doesn't know you yet. I pray that you will make yourself real to them in your own time, in your own way, choosing just those circumstances in which they will be humbled in which they will realize their need of your mercy, in which they will come to be your slaves forever. For your service is perfect freedom. We thank you for claiming Paul. We thank you for apprehending him, arresting him on his way to arrest your brethren. We thank you that he remained yours to his life's end, and that even though he finished up in Roman chains, the real chains that bound him were the chains of love, the chains that bound him to yourself. Lord, just now we pray that you'll bind us to you forever, that we may wait in the city and do what you tell us to do. We ask it for your name's sake. Amen.